And yes, if all works out, there will be an episode for every show that aired on the channel, including that one time they just played reruns of Mork and Mindy. Why? Because somebody in the Nickelodeon corporate offices decided that the channel's intents and values were reflected by Mork and Mindy reruns. This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon, in a galaxy far, far away. By the late 80s and into the 1990s, it had become tradition for Nickelodeon to air a couple of shows from Nick at Night during the daytime hours. This had originally been a tactic to sell Nick at Night to cable providers, as the late evening, early morning programming block was technically a separate channel from Nickelodeon, and not every cable provider offered it. That stopped being an issue going into the 90s, but the tradition persisted for a while, and in fact, in 1991, Nickelodeon quadrupled down on it. Not one, not two, not three, but four Baby Boomer era television shows were added to Nickelodeon's lineup that year. We already covered one of them, Jeff's Collie, aka the first three seasons of Lassie that were separated and syndicated away from the more iconic Timmy years. Lassie had been a staple on the channel since 1984. But in 1991, a year that was already overflowing with new programming, Nickelodeon decided to double dip, airing Lassie in the morning and Jeff's Collie in the afternoon. Jeff's Collie was not a Nick at Night crossover show, however. It remained a daytime Nick exclusive. The other three shows were crossovers, and we're going to spend the next three videos knocking them down one by one and seeing what they contributed and why, in such a busy year, they were added to the schedule. I cannot promise actual answers. First up, we're looking at the show that put legendary comedian Robin Williams on the map. Premiering on Nick at Night on March 4th and on Daytime Nickelodeon on June 7th, this is Mork and Mindy. You can't always count on your battery. But you can count on Mork. He's always supercharged. <laughs> on Mork and Mindy, every weekday in Nickelodeon's Ozone. Assigned by the planet Ork to observe Earth customs, the alien Mork, Robin Williams, arrives on our planet in his interplanetary egg. And the first Earthling he comes across is Mindy McConnell, played by Pam Dauber, who mistakes the silly extraterrestrial for a priest and brings him home with her. It quickly becomes apparent that Mork is, well, quite odd. It occurs to me we have not been formally introduced. A formal introduction is at hand. Ba -da, ba -da. Get down. <laughs> I am Mork from Mork. Nanu Nanu. I'm I'm Mindy McConnell. Ta -ta, ta -ta. <sighs> <laughs> ah. Mork drinks with his finger, sits on his head, and his spacesuit is kind of alive. At first Mindy is freaked out, but eventually comes to find the strange alien man endearing and invites him to stay in her attic. And so we follow this unlikely pair in their day-to-day -day lives. Mindy is a modern woman trying to make it through dating, college, and the job market, while Mork is a curious little imp inquiring about basic ideas that we take for granted, like love, friendship, and even democracy. See, in a democracy, everybody votes and then the majority wins. Well, I vote we adopt Dolly Parton. <laughs> 
Do I win? <laughs> no, with two people, you can't have a winner. Oh, sounds like democracy will never replace bobbing for french fries. <laughs> Complicating matters is Mindy's overbearing father, Fred, played by Conrad Janis, a music store owner and widower who hates the idea that his only daughter is all grown up, and when he confuses Mork for Mindy's boyfriend, he does not approve. What are you doing here? Now, I don't want any stories or any excuses. I want the plain, unvarnished truth. I spent the night. <laughs> Couldn't you have varnished it just a little? Fred is balanced out by his mother-in-law and Mindy's grandmother, Mrs. Hudson, played by Elizabeth Kerr, a hip older woman who's in a modern rock and just having a good time. He won't play anything by Alice Cooper. <laughs> That's because I play piano. Alice Cooper just beats on the keys with a dead snake. <laughs> but at least he shows feeling. Are you two gonna start this again? Eventually, both of them discover Mork's alien nature and come to accept him as part of the family. Rounding out the cast of characters is Franklin Bickley, played by Tom Poston, Mindy's downstairs neighbor, and Grouch, always complaining about kids these days. Hey, hey, kid! Yes, you! That was a terrific throw! Let's see you do it again! <laughs> oh, amazing! Do you think you could throw it to me? Huh? Oh! Scuzzy <laughs> little yard monkey! There's Eugene, played by Jeffrey Jaquette. A young man who comes down to the music store for violin lessons and swiftly becomes one of Mork's best friends. He teaches Mork how to be cool. There's Susan, played by the one and only Morgan Fairchild, Mindy's former high school best friend who's grown quite shallow, in it for the looks and the money. And finally, Exidor, played by Robert Donner, a cult leader without followers who speaks to imaginary friends and goes on strange tangents. The only person to really match Mork in his weird energies. I tried Buddhism, Catholicism, Judaism, Punch and Judaism. <laughs> but nothing worked for me until I found him. Who? Mark? I worship O.J. Simpson! <laughs> Each episode ends with Mork sending a mental projection across the stars to his supervisor, Orson, voiced by Ralph James, to whom Mork reports on what he learned that day, but only after throwing a few fat jokes at Orson's expense. This better be good, Mork. You got me out of the shower. Oh, please don't shake yourself dry this time, your immenseness. Last time it rained for weeks. <laughs> it's a premise ripe with potential. Mork maintains a childlike innocence in everything, so when he encounters things we take for granted in our modern adult world, He's quick to deflate the situation and show us how silly it all is. Why yes, the hoops you have to jump through in immigration service are quite silly. Occasionally, this can lead to some very profound sentiments. This week, I discovered a terrible earth disease called loneliness. Do many people on earth suffer from this illness? Oh yes sir, and how they suffer. You see Orson, loneliness is a disease of the spirit, and people who have it think that no one cares about them. Do you have any idea why? Yes sir, you can count on me. You see, when children are young, they're told not to talk to strangers. Then when they go to school, they're told not to talk to the person next to them. And finally, when they get to be very old, they're told not to talk to themselves. Who's left? There are definitely philosophical readings one can make of Mork's character, the wise fool who meditates on what he learned every night. Mork makes a point of practicing nonviolence, even in self-defense. He is decidedly not modern, not masculine, not hip, not cool. And he doesn't mind that one little bit. Why should he change? It's everyone else who's weird. <clears throat> Don't Orkins have any method of defending themselves? Oh, yes, but they're all nonviolent. Let's see, there's running away. Running away? And whimpering. And for dangerous situations, we use compliments. <laughs> compliments? What do you mean? Come at me. OK. You have very lovely hair. <laughs> I mean, what's left of it? <laughs> But these interesting themes aren't why people were watching. No, you watched Mork and Mindy to see this Robin Williams kid just go crazy all over the set, switching from impression to impression at the speed of light, taking on physicalities that really made you believe he was an alien. Anybody in there? <laughs> Little hatchling brothers, you must revolt. 
revolt against your oppressors. You have nothing to lose but your shells. As much as I like Mindy, it's against intergalactic law to eat fellow space travelers. Fly, be free! <laughs> Well, I guess we'll have to have a quick burial at sea, then. <laughs> Robin Williams, born July 21st, 1951, the son of an automobile executive and a model, a student of Juilliard, began doing stand-up in 1976, first in San Francisco, then in Los Angeles, where he was scouted by television producer George Schlatter for a six-episode 1977 revival of Rowan and Martin's Laughing. Wednesday. Here's laughing. With Robin Williams, Frank Sinatra, James Garner, Flip Wilson, and Cindy Williams. Sell my clothes, I'm going to heaven. That show failed to find an audience, but when Mork and Mindy hit big, NBC attempted to rerun it in 1979, hoping that Williams' newfound marquee value would bring in the views. The revival certainly didn't have Happy Days numbers. This sitcom about the daily lives of teenagers in the 1950s had been a huge success for ABC getting the highest Nielsen rating for the 1976 to 1977 season. Happy Days was created by Gary Marshall. Marshall got his start writing for popular sitcoms like The Lucy Show and The Dick Van Dyke Show before kicking off a long-term relationship with Paramount Television in 1970. The first show he developed was a sitcom adaptation of Neil Simon's play The Odd Couple, which didn't get great ratings initially, but swung up in the reruns. Marshall's next show, Me and the Chimp, was a bit less successful. <laughs> the full story of Happy Days is long and complicated and beyond the purview of this video, but hey, it did air on Nick at Night, and if we get my Patreon up to $1,000 a video, I'll start a new series, Nick Knacks at Night. The Cliff Notes version, Marshall was asked to script out a pilot based on an idea developed by Michael Eisner, of all people. The pilot wasn't picked up initially, but instead was edited into an episode of the anthology show Love American Style. Airing in 1972, Love and the television set told the story of the Cunninghams becoming the first family in the neighborhood to get a television set. The segment was alright. It didn't set the world on fire, but it did inspire an up-and-coming filmmaker named George Lucas, to cast the segment's lead, Ron Howard, as the lead of his own 50s nostalgia piece, American Graffiti, which became a sleeper hit. This brought renewed interest to the Love American Style segment, and soon, Happy Days made its premiere on January 15th, 1974. It was a bit of a slow burden to start, but its popularity really picked up after a secondary greaser character named Fonzie, played by Henry Winkler, was promoted to the main cast. In 1976, Happy Days received its first of many spin-offs, Laverne and Shirley, starring Cindy Williams and Gary Marshall's sister, Penny Marshall. Laverne and Shirley was a smash hit, eventually dethroning even Happy Days as the number one show in America. You can imagine that Paramount, whom Michael Eisner was now the president of, wanted to keep this ball rolling. 1977, the year Robin Williams got his start on television. 1977, the year Happy Days was at its peak. 1977, also the year a little scrappy indie film called Star Wars took the world by storm. People had space adventures, aliens and robots on their mind, including Gary Marshall's son. The story goes that Marshall's daughters loved Happy Days, but his son Scott just wasn't into it. What would make you watch the show? I asked eight-year-old Scott as he sat in his room playing with his menagerie of Star Wars dolls. If it had a space alien on it, he said. Now, a space alien showing up in a comedic but otherwise grounded sitcom might seem absurd, but Star Wars really was that strong of an influence on pop culture. What's interesting is that it wasn't an immediate hard cut to science fiction, but a gradual transition, where the beige and bell-bottoms media of the early 70s bled into the genre fiction. Most infamously, you had the Star Wars Holiday Special, in which Star Wars characters were filtered through the tacky variety shows that were all over television in the 70s. A disco remix of the Star Wars theme was number one in the Billboard charts. The Carpenters, of all people, had a special about making first contact with aliens. Holding occupants of interplanetary craft
So an alien showing up on Happy Days wasn't that strange for the pop culture landscape of the time, especially going into Happy Days' fifth season. You know, the season with the episode Hollywood Part 3. The episode in which the Fonz does a water ski jump over sharks. The moment from which the term Jump the Shark was coined. Happy Days Season 5 Episode 22 My Favorite Orkin was written by Gary Marshall and Joe Glauberg. According to the cast, the original script was pretty awful, and the actor originally cast in the role of Mork, Impressionist John Biner, best known as the voices for United Artists' Ant and Aardvark shorts, quit on the first day of rehearsals. Names like Don DeLuise and Jonathan Winters were floated as possible replacements, but schedules just didn't line up for that. So the production ended up going through the audition process as fast as they could get away with. Enter Robin Williams. Around 1 o'clock, the actors started coming in. We saw 50 people. They were all terrible. About 5 o'clock, in walked this boy with rainbow suspenders. When he sat down, I asked if he could sit a little differently, the way an alien might. Immediately, he sat on his head. We hired him. Hey, would you just mind having a seat? Seat? Si. Yes. Oh. Oh. <laughs> My Favorite Orkin originally aired on February 28th, 1978. Richie Cunningham thinks he saw a flying saucer outside of Arnold's drive-in, but nobody believes him. That is until Mork shows up at Richie's front door, looking for an average Earthling to bring up to Ork with him. Richie doesn't want to go, and the fawn steps in to protect his buddy. Hey, wait a minute, wait. Look at his thumb. You see what he's doing with his thumb? Impossible, this has never happened before. Yeah, well, you never ran up against the fawns before, bucko. <laughs> Thankfully, it turns out that this was all just a dream caused by all the stress Richie's been under studying for a test. And yeah, I do have to agree, the script isn't great. It's over the top, inconsequential, born from chasing trends, and points out just what a cartoon character Fonzie already was. But the script was hardly the point. The point is seeing what this Robin Williams kid can do. He's fast, he's weird, but he's very charismatic, and he never breaks character. Reportedly, Williams received a standing ovation from the studio audience. When Michael Eisner approached Gary Marshall about another Happy Day spinoff, there was a pretty obvious frontrunner. And this fall, a man from space will conquer Earth. More. 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 He will bring his superior technology. Only one suitcase? They lost half my luggage. You nimnos. He will seek out our leaders. Remember me? Mark from Mark? Well, I think he came to the right place. He will learn our ways. Why a man dates a woman. And he's a fast learner most of the time. Your suit's on backwards. <laughs> it is. Boy, do I feel like a clone. But he's full of surprises and a special magic that won't quit. You really are from out there. No, actually, I'm from out there. <laughs> You see, out there is not a nice neighborhood. I wouldn't even go there doing a total eclipse. What he wants is Mindy. You're not going to hurt me, are you? Hurt you? No, damaging other life forms is unthinkable to us. I wouldn't harm a hawk on your chole cho cho. But Mindy's got some tricks of her own. Thank you, Sox. I could get to like that. And you'll get to love Mork and Mindy. <laughs> Mork and Mindy premiered on ABC on September 14th, 1978 less than seven months after My Favorite Orkin aired. A few retcons were put into place, Mork used his powers to convince Richie it was all a dream, and the pilot episode features flashbacks to a second meeting with Fonzie and Laverne. But after that, Mork and Mindy sat pretty far apart from its sibling shows, now taking place in the contemporary 70s instead of the nostalgic 50s. Robin Williams did a lot to develop the show's humor and identity. Some have said Williams improvised everything, but that's not entirely true. There was improvisation on the set, but Morgan Mindy had a pretty dedicated writer's room building the framework from which Williams could build his jokes on top of. Williams was in constant conversation with the writers and producers, pitching ideas and polishing things during every stage of production, which gave the show its distinct character, but was not always the easiest way to produce a television show. Robin would love a line or bit on Monday, but by Friday, he would be tired of it and want a new one to replace it. 
the process exhausted the writers and forced us to look for new writers to replenish the staff each season. Mork and Mindy wasn't such a picnic for the other actors either, because they rarely got the same cue from Robin twice. Everybody learned to adapt because they all loved Robin. Mork and Mindy was a quick success, its first season ranking number three in the Nielsen ratings, tying with Happy Days and sitting behind Three's Company and Laverne and Shirley, both ABC shows. A fantastic showing for such a goofy premise, and Robin Williams quickly became a household name. The series got a solid amount of merchandise as well, aiming at a younger audience. It was a popular show. So naturally, the people at ABC went, cool, congratulations. Now let's change everything about it. Mork and Mindy has one of the most absurd second season overhauls I think I've ever seen. First off, a change in time slot, moving the show from Thursday to Saturday. This meant that instead of competing against the Waltons in their final creaky years, Mork and Mindy was up against the new All in the Family follow-up, Archie Bunker's Place. This was a battle it would not win. In an attempt to appeal to a more young adult audience, the season one cast was gutted. Fred, Mrs. Hudson, Susan, and Eugene were all kicked to the curb. To replace them, season two introduced Remo and Jeannie Da Vinci, played by Jay Thomas and Gina Hetch. Sibling co-owners of a local delicatessen, they're young, always arguing, and are Italian. And that's about it. What do you mean my medical books are stupid? You should talk with all the dumb muscle magazines you read. Those aren't dumb muscle magazines. It's a physical fitness manual. Muscle, muscle, muscle. Don't push me, because I'll do what you hate. Oh, Remo, go flex yourself. For a more antagonizing presence, the show also introduced Mindy's snooty cousin, Nelson Flavor, played by Jim Stathel, a young, out-of-touch, aspiring politician running for city council. Some member of the lunatic fringe has been calling and saying that if I don't drop out of the city council race, I better start praying. It's going to be trouble because Mindy said you didn't have a prayer. <laughs> Gary Marshall wasn't as creatively involved for season two, already juggling three TV shows and spending some time in New York City to work in theater. The series pivoted away from alien learning about humans concept and opted for stories developing the relationship between Mork and Mindy, pivoting things into a more romantic direction. Mork gets quite invested in getting Mindy to kiss him, going so far as to insult her in hopes that they can kiss and make up. I thought you liked my cookie. You had a thought? Uh, I didn't think there was anything under that little Barbie doll hairdo of yours. Whoa, look, echo, echo, echo. Why, why don't you just shave it all off and get yourself a mohawk? That way it draws attention away from your nose. My nose is my nose. Are you kidding? It's Shiksa City. When the show's not doing that, it's doing some very cartoony, absurd stuff. Season two opens with a two-parter, Mork in Wonderland. After taking some cold medicine, Mork starts shrinking and eventually shrinks into an alternate dimension where a bunch of comedian impersonators have formed a rebel army against an oppressive kingdom. Yeah, it's funny, kid, but uh, get yourself a tux, huh? Well, excuse me. Then there's Mork vs. the Necrotons, in which sexy lady aliens kidnap Mork to get information on Earth out of him, with Raquel Welch playing the evil alien captain. Come darling, kiss his little neck. No, oh, don't leave a mark. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Now, hold him down. I want to read to him. Oh, reading can't hurt me. I've been to Evelyn Wood. <laughs> oh, no? What about smutty limericks? <laughs> no, you're despicable! You're despicable! There's an episode where they meet a robot. There's an episode where they meet the ghost of Mindy's mother. There's an episode where they meet the Denver Bronco cheerleaders. And then, just for contrast, there's an episode where Mork takes on the Ku Klux Klan. I don't think love works. Maybe we better try a little understanding. I feel strange. Me too. <gasps> Look! Blake is black! <laughs> Look, what happened? Well, I just kind of reprogrammed their genes. <laughs> what are they going to say? 
stay this way? Well, only until they learn about brotherhood without the hood. Man, that is some tonal whiplash. Throw in a reworked opening theme with more of a disco edge, and you end up with one of the most unnecessary, trying too hard to be hip reimaginings on television. And it did not work. Mork and Mindy's ratings plummeted from number three to number 27. I think the stories just got too complex, and we got away from the simplicity of the character. Mork and Mindy originally worked because it was about this cheerful little man from outer space doing very simple things. Mork buys bread, or Mork deals with racism. The charm of the show, I think, was in having Pam Dauber deal with me in normal, everyday situations, to which I would react in bizarre ways. The show began with very human roots. If the stories ever became too complex, which was what happened to Mork and Mindy, there still would have been some funny things going on, but the show wouldn't have been nearly as effective. I didn't want to see a Mork and Mindy bastardized that way, but it was. The show scrambled to repair the damage. With Fred returning as a regular in season three and Mrs. Hudson making a guest appearance, child characters were reintroduced, with Mork getting a job at a daycare center, one kid being there just to be the source of more fat jokes. Hey, what's wrong with this refrigerator? I can't see anything in here. Well, I took the bow out, Stephanie. I knew you were coming. <laughs> Go suck a lemon. The plots became more grounded, closer to season one style, though there were a few exceptions. One little odd meta episode was Mork meets Robin Williams. Mork starts getting swarmed by Robin Williams fans, because in this universe, Robin Williams is an actual, real actor and comedian, and Mork, of course, looks just like him. Mindy, who's a reporter at this point in the show, gets an interview with Robin Williams, who details some of his own anxieties about being in show business. It also looks like you're probably taken advantage of a lot. You know, if you learn to say no, you probably have a lot more time to yourself. Uh, maybe that's the last thing I want. It's a fine episode on its own, but it takes a lot more meaning now. Now that we know how William's story ended. It sounds to me like they have it made. Well, most of them do, sir, but some are victims of their own fame. Very special and talented people. People like Elvis Presley, Mel Monroe, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Lenny Bruce, Freddie Prince, and John Lennon. Season 3 was a return to form for Mork and Mindy, but the damage was already done, dropping in ratings to number 49. Season 4 tried to make the sitcom more serialized, with Mork and Mindy getting married, Mork getting pregnant, laying a giant egg, and the birth of their son, Mirth, played by Jonathan Winters, who you may remember was considered for the role of Mork. You know what would make me really happy? If Mirth would call me Mommy. Mirth? <laughs> <laughs> mommy, Mur. Mommy, mommy. mommy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Daddy. <laughs> Shoot. Season four dropped to number sixty in the ratings, and there's just no saving it. So ABC pulled the plug. Mork and Mindy airing its ninety-first and final episode on May twenty-seventh, nineteen eighty-two. Though it wasn't quite the end for these characters. Most of the Happy Days franchise didn't survive too far into the 80s. Laverne and Shirley was out in 1983, Happy Days itself was out by 1984, and other attempts at spin-offs like Blansky's Beauties, Out of the Blue, and Joni Loves Chachi failed to take off. However, the franchise found another home, albeit briefly, in animation. It started with the Fonz and the Happy Days gang in 1980. Produced by Hanna-Barbera, this series saw Fonzie, Richie, and their dog, Mr. Cool, traveling across time, visiting the Old West, running into Dracula, and winding up on the moon. I'm pretty sure all of that would have happened on Happy Days if it had lived for another season or two. This was followed by Laverne and Shirley in the Army in 1981, in which the titular characters do just that. They join the Army. Their superior is a pig named Sergeant Squealy. Yeah, I'm not making any of this up. In September of 1982, a few months after cancellation, 
Mork and Mindy made their animation debut in the Mork and Mindy slash Laverne and Shirley slash Fawn's Hour, which saw the previous two cartoons edited together with a new Mork and Mindy cartoon. No work? Please don't drink it with your fingers. Someone might see you. Here, you're supposed to use a straw. Mm. Ooh, earthly inventions are clever, clever. Robin Williams and Pam Dauber reprised their roles, but this being an 80s era Hanna-Barbera cartoon, it was somehow less animated than the live action show. Williams tones down his performance in kind, his voice soft and slow. Mark, the sharks are a bunch of dangerous hoodlums. Not true, men. They have jobs, and I helped them pull their biggest job last night. Oh no, I'm afraid to ask. Just what job did you pull, Mark? We emptied the school safe. Wow, animated Mork is jacked. The plots aren't that out there, and some of them are repeats from the sitcom, like Mork dealing with a bully or getting shrunk down. The Mork and Mindy slash Laverne and Shirley slash Fonz Hour aired its last new episode on September 3rd, 1983, marking the final end for Mork and Mindy. Well, how about some Mork and Mindy trivia before we move on? There was a Brazilian remake of the series in 1979 called Super Bronco, starring comedian Ronald Gollius. In 1982, Robin Williams hosted the television special E.T. and Friends, Magical Movie Visitors, one part advertising for this new Steven Spielberg flick, one part an exploration of aliens in movies and television. It doesn't make any overt references to Mork and Mindy, but you can't tell me that's not what they were going for with Williams in this red spacesuit improvising jokes as a used spaceship salesman. And if you make it wonderful to you right now, I want you to know we're going to give you this incredible record of all the great science fiction hits. Who can never forget? Or this one. Or how about... Also, this sound effect can be for the kids. Yes, if you're two-dimensional, this is the vehicle for you. Come on down to Al Centuri's use and Jerry vehicles. Yes, come on down here. We're at the black hole at the end of the universe. And now back to our feature, What the Heck is That? Gary Marshall would use the 1980s to pivot into film, directing films like Overboard, Pretty Woman, and The Princess Diaries. Pam Dauber starred in another sitcom, My Sister Sam, from 1986 to 1988, and has acted off and on since. Syndicated reruns of Mork and Mindy ran throughout the 80s, which brings us to 1991. Was Mork and Mindy a good choice for Nickelodeon? While goofy in ways that still entertain today, a lot of the show's humor was very contemporary, with a lot of jokes about modern politics and pop culture that would have been a decade and change old when airing in 1991. I know you don't know me and I don't want to impose, but I'm supposed to get an interview with you for KTNS, and, and if I don't, I'll be fired. Yeah, it's just been a bad year for us. She bet on Carter, Roberta Duran, and she had to buy Chrysler stock, too. <laughs> that of its time humor is perfect for Nick and Knight when you're playing to the nostalgic sensibilities of the parents, but as a child born after the show was canceled, a lot of it goes over your head. A lot of the episodes dealt with adult domestic situations. You got five episodes about Mindy's dating life or employment situation for every episode about Mork shrinking into an alternate dimension. In comparison to other Nick and Knight runoffs on daytime Nickelodeon, Mork and Mindy most closely resembled Mr. Ed. Don't worry, I like Mork and Mindy way more than I like Mr. Ed. But it's a similar adult-oriented domestic sitcom with no child regulars, dominated by a larger-than-life gimmick. Mr. Ed had his talking horse, Mork and Mindy had its Robin Williams space alien. And believe it or not, there was a time when Robin Williams was not a guaranteed draw for younger audiences. Nickelodeon's airing of Mork and Mindy predated Aladdin, Fern Gully, Mrs. Doubtfire, and Jumanji. The last family film Williams had headlined was Robert Altman's Popeye in 1980, which barely made back its budget and was a critical flop on release. Robin Williams spent the 80s mostly pivoting into dramatic roles, like Good Morning Vietnam and The Dead Poets Society, both of which netted him a Best Actor Oscar nomination. All of this would change in December of 1991 with Hook, the Steven Spielberg film in which Robin Williams plays an all-grown-up Peter Pan. This was Williams' first major family film in over a decade, and Nickelodeon may have been betting on the film's success early on, with Hook getting a pretty substantial feature on Nickelodeon's magazine show The Nick Hit List. Another thing to consider was that Mork and Minnie was conveniently at hand. 
Viacom had already purchased the syndication rights and had been airing the show on HA, Viacom's comedy cable channel. When HA began merging with HBO's comedy channel to become Comedy Central, the show was passed over to the Nickelodeon side of things. We've already paid for this, we should probably get some use out of it. As you saw in the commercial spot, Mork and Mindy aired during Ozone, a three-hour programming block that aired weekdays beginning at 5 p.m. And as far as I can tell, Ozone had no theme or point. It was just the after school and homework hours for the channel. Nickelodeon would repurpose the name as the Nickel Ozone beginning in 1998 and up through 2000. And again, it was just the after school programming on the nights that Snick wasn't playing. I think all of this ultimately comes down to 1991 being a very turbulent year for Nickelodeon with a lot of shows shifting around and the channel needing to fill a hole in the schedule. Mork and Mindy was goofy, starred an A-list celebrity, and was readily available. It's probably nothing more complicated than that. It still makes a lot more sense than the time the channel aired hanging in. There are still things kids could get from Mork and Mindy in 1991. Mork and Mindy aired for the last time on Daytime Nickelodeon on January 3rd, 1992. Its Nick and Night run would last a bit longer, airing up to September 24th, 1995. In 2014, Robin Williams and Pam Dauber reunited one last time in an episode of The Crazy Ones. It's been, what, 32 years? Oh my God. Oh, 32 I years. I remember oh, there were three crazy. cameras and they shot on film. <laughs> it was a really good time. It was the 70s after all. Yes, <laughs> what I remember. Yes, I know. <laughs> a few months after, Robin Williams would sadly take his own life on August 11th, 2014, at the age of 63. It's a loss we're still feeling nine years later. Even after all this time, I feel compelled to make this some sort of tribute. The man was just that talented, that caring, that charismatic, and just that funny. At the time of this writing, Mork and Mindy is available in its entirety on DVD and is available for free streaming on Pluto TV. Mork and Mindy was a good show that could have been a great show. It showed a lot of promise in its first season, with an absurd character that was somehow less absurd than our actual real world. It's a shame then that poor creative decisions prevented it from living up to its potential. As a show on Nickelodeon, it's something of a half effort. I'm sure it had some appeal to the logistics people, name brand recognition and all that, but it didn't fit in comfortably with where Nickelodeon was at the time. A good show? Sure. A good Nick and Night show? Absolutely. A good Nickelodeon show? Eh. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Next time, we follow up a retro Nick at Night show about an alien with powers living among humanity whose lead actor tragically ended his own life with a retro Nick and Night show about an alien with powers living among humanity whose lead actor tragically ended his own life. Today's research shout-out goes to Wake Me When It's Funny, How to Break Into Show Business and Stay There by Gary Marshall and Lori Marshall, a very fun autobiography from the creator of Happy Days, Mork and Mindy, and Laverne and Shirley. Lots of great details, lots of production photos, a good book for anyone interested in television history in general. Thank you all for watching! If you like support knickknacks and other Pop Arena projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to production values, research material, and food. Because I need to eat. Remember, if you like these looks at Nick at Night shows, I'll be doing knickknacks at night if the Patreon reaches a thousand dollars a video. You can also support the channel by liking the video, subscribing, hitting that bell icon for notifications, leaving a comment, sending a one-time donation through PayPal or Coffee, following me on social media, and sharing knickknacks with all your friends. I'll see you next time, and remember, Black Lives Matter.